Good evening, everybody. Welcome to CGS, Citizens for Global Solutions in Minnesota. Thank you for attending. This is our uh, third Thursday's uh, movie discussion. Tonight, we are talking about the movie Just Mercy, the true story of Brian um, Stevenson, a uh, Harvard graduate, went to Alabama and he started up and he is still today uh, defending uh, inmates in the death row. Uh, tonight we have uh, wonderful speakers, Amy Bergquist and Stephen Rodi. Let me introduce you to them. Uh, uh, Stephen Rode is a constitutional scholar, lecturer, writer, political act activist, and retired uh, civil right, uh, rights lawyer. He's a founder and chair of Interfaith Communities United for Justice and Peace, and past president of the ACLU of so Southern California, a past chair of Band the Ark, a Jewish partnership for justice, and is on the board of Death Penalty Focus. He has represented two inmates on California's death row. He also has written for the Los Angeles Times, Huff, Huffington, Huffington Post, and others. Amy Bernquist. Uh, she, coordinated, she coordinates the Advocates for Human Rights Advocacy at the United Nations and regional human rights bodies. Her substantive areas of focus includes uh, LGBT rights and discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity rights of minorities and non-citizens non and the death penalty. She also coordinates pro bono legal assistance to support non-governmental non organizations based in Africa that work on human rights and the rule of law issues. She represents the advocates on the steering committee of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Berquist is commission, commissioner on the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights and I know everybody's going to appreciate to know she clerked for the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And with that, I would uh, like to open the floor to Amy. Please, Amy, we would love to hear from you, your experience uh, related to death penalty. Welcome and thank you for coming. Thanks so much, Katya. It's great to be here. And thank you to the Minnesota chapter of Citizens for Global Solutions. I think it's great that you have these activities. And one of the advantages of having all of this happening in a virtual space is that we can have people from all over the world, all over the country together to have a conversation. So I really, uh, I'm really grateful to, to you for this opportunity. My name is Amy Berquist, as Katya said, and I am a senior staff attorney at the Advocates for Human Rights, which is based in Minneapolis. Minneapolis. We've been around for since 1983. Um, my role, I like to describe it as being a um, microphone. Um, when we collaborate with partner organizations around the world, my role is to give that microphone to our partners to make sure that their voices are heard, to try to put pressure on their government better to respect human rights. Um, I, as, as Katya said, the, the Advocates for Human Rights is a member of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. We're on the steering committee of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty, and I am a vice president of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty as well. So we have a leadership role in the global movement to abolish the death penalty. Uh, and with our coalition members at the World Coalition, we collaborate with them to do advocacy uh, to try to abolish the death penalty. Um, so we help them um, write reports and do advocacy with the United Nations. We also do advocacy on death penalty issues in the United States, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I also, or the advocates also chairs the World Coalition's World Day Working Group um, every 
year, October 10th is marked as World Day Against the Death Penalty. And every year there's a theme and last year, and this theme is particularly relevant for your discussion of just mercy, last year the theme was access to counsel in death penalty cases. The theme for 2021 this October will be women who are sentenced to death or executed. Um, and one thing I really like about the idea of having a theme for World Day against the death penalty is it shows the cross-cutting issues that the issue of access to counsel and adequate legal representation in capital cases isn't something that's unique to the United States. It's something where we see these issues around the world. Um, and I'll put some links in the chat that might be of interest if you wanna learn more for World Day Against the Death Penalty last year, we hosted a, a continuing legal education, a training for lawyers, but I think even for non-lawyers, it's also of interest. We had, it, it focused on the issue in the United States. And so we had some experts uh, on the issue of legal counsel in, um, in the United States in capital cases, you can take a look at that. Um, and I'll also post the materials from World Day Against the Death Penalty last year if you wanna learn more about the issue from a global perspective. Um, I think what one thing I'd like to do is give you sort of an example of the work the Advocates for Human Rights has done to try to address death penalty issues in the United States by using international mechanism by using the United Nations. Um, there's a lot of great work going on domestically in the United States to ensure that there are good attorneys representing people um, and to ensure that they have their rights can be vindicated on appeal and in habeas proceedings and all of that. Um, but being based in the United States where in, in Minnesota where there is no death penalty and you know very rarely does it come up at the federal level in Minnesota, um, one of the ways we think we add value is by adding this international dimension to the work that we do. And we engage a lot of attorneys on a pro bono basis to assist with our advocacy at the United Nations. So I'll post in the chat the stakeholder report that we submitted for the United Nations recent review of the United States on death penalty issues. You can take a look at that if you want to learn more. Um, but the the review that most recently took place, and this was um, happened in November of last year, was something called the Universal Periodic Review. And this is something, as the name suggests, every country goes through it. It's universal. It happens every five years for each country, and it's a review of their human rights record. So it's a chance to talk about anything related to human rights in a particular country. And one of the issues we focused on, among others, was the death penalty. We also, the Advocates for Human Rights also does a lot of work on the rights of non-citizens. We represent people seeking asylum. So we also did a report on those issues as well related to the rights of of immigrants and asylum seekers. Uh, so the first step in the process of using this tool, this UN tool, is to submit a report. So it's gathering information, putting it together in a report. Um, and we often enlist attorneys on a pro bono basis to help us do that work. Uh, but that's really just the first step in the process. In this report, you'll see, if you take a look at it, the date was October 2019. Um, and the review itself didn't happen until more than a year later. That's partly because of a delay because of the pandemic, but also just because it's, it's a long cycle. So we submitted the report in October of 2019. And then the next step of the process is to do lobbying. And our role is to reach out to governments around the world that are concerned about the death penalty in the United States and to give them information that they can use to try to press our government to change, to change with respect to the death penalty. So, um, the, the universal periodic, periodic review is a peer review process. It's where governments review the human rights records of other governments. And so we're going to examine, okay, which governments do we think might be interested in death penalty issues in the United States um, and we'll lobby them. So like a country like China is probably not going to press the United States to abolish the death penalty because China is the, the world's leading executioner. So we're not going to talk to China about those issues. That would be a waste of our time, but countries that are really firmly committed to the abolition of the death penalty and are really vocal about it, those are the countries who are our target audience. So we do a lot of analysis of which countries we want to reach out to. And we, um, the, part of the review process is that countries have the chance to make recommendations. So they can make recommendations recommendations to the United States to say, we recommend you do blah, 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 X, Y, Z. Um, 
And then that recommendation triggers on the part of the United States or whatever country is being reviewed, the, the obligation to respond, to say yes or no to each recommendation that they use, uh, that, they, that they receive. And if a country accepts the recommendation, then that country has five years to implement it, to do what they promised in front of the whole world to do that they have to keep their promises. So it's a great opportunity to do advocacy and to try to get public commitments from governments, not just the United States, but all sorts of governments to abolish the death penalty or to take other steps toward um, toward abolition. Now, when we seek recommendations, we of course would love every government in the world to recommend that the United States abolish the death penalty and take other steps toward abolition. Um, so quantity is a great thing. Um, and we like recommendations to say that the United States abolish the, should abolish the death penalty, but we know realistically that our government, whether it's the previous administration or the current administration, is probably not in a position to commit to, yes, we're gonna abolish the death penalty. We, we know that they will say, well, we don't have the authority at the federal level because states have their, you know, states are allowed to have the death penalty. Um, so, so we know that we can shoot for the sky, but, but we're probably not going to get those commitments, especially on a, with a five year turnaround. Um, so oftentimes what we will do in our lobbying is suggest that governments make what we call more incremental recommendations. We suggest that they make recommendations that would help move the ball forward, maybe wouldn't lead to to complete abolition of the death penalty, but would help improve the situation, would help reduce the number of people sentenced to death, improve the um, respect for human rights in the process, like ensuring fair trial rights and all of that. Um, and sometimes what we'll push for is what I like to call the offer you can't refuse. The recommendations where it would be really awkward and diplomatically uncomfortable if the government didn't accept the recommendation. The example I like to give is with Japan. Japan um, is is another you know uh, country that has has executions on a regular basis and embraces the death penalty, and what we know from our analysis of the Japanese government's position on the death penalty is they often um, rely on public opinion. They say, well, the Japanese public supports the death penalty, and therefore we have to keep it because that's what the people want. Uh, we've seen in the United States, of course, a big shift in public opinion. There used to be a lot of public support, and now that public support is, is dwindling, uh, but. But one of the things we pushed for, and Australia made a recommendation the last time Japan was going through this process, um, uh, on our advice, the recommendation was to engage in a public awareness raising campaign about the death penalty and the human rights issues related to the death penalty. We, the reason we did this is because the Japanese government engages in a lot of secrecy about the death penalty. They don't tell the public who's been sentenced to death, how many people are on death row, even when the executions are happening. And so this was sort of a way to call the Japanese government's bluff. If they're going to rely on public opinion, then that public opinion should be well informed. So Australia made that recommendation, that more incremental recommendation about public opinion. And lo and behold, the Japanese government rejected that recommendation. They looked pretty bad. It was kind of embarrassing for them because they said basically, no, we don't want the public to be informed. We'd rather keep them in the dark and yet still rely on the public opinion as a justification for the death penalty. Um, so that's sort of what, the way we approach it, thinking about what recommendations we'd like governments to make. Um, we do our lobbying by sending out lots of emails. We set up a virtual side event this time around where the governments of the world could come and attend and hear from, from us and from other experts to get more information. And then we also held and, and do hold when we're able to go to Geneva one-on-one -on -one meetings. So we can have sort of a more in-depth conversation with the diplomats who will be making those recommendations to give them the information they need and to talk about what kinds of recommendations we'd like to see. Uh, so uh, we were in a really interesting situation with the Universal Periodic Review of the United States because it was delayed. The actual um, time when the recommendations were made, what they call the interactive dialogue, was November 9th, 2020. Now, if you think back to November 2020, there was another thing that happened the week before that um, UN review, and that was the election. So, so we had had the presidential election. Um, I think we had just learned the results of that election that weekend. Uh, and so it was still the the previous administration that was the one going to Geneva and talking about it. But at this point, it was a lame duck administration. They were outgoing. And the deadline for responding for the, to the recommendations wasn't until March of 2021. 
So it's actually the current administration, the Biden administration, that gave the responses to the recommendations that the Trump administration received. So it was really interesting to have the review straddle the two, the, the two administrations. Uh, but what happened in Geneva on November 9th was there were 116 countries that took the floor. And because it's a limited amount of time, each country had just 55 seconds to speak. The United States received a total of 347 recommendations, uh, and 34 of them were about the death penalty. So about a third of all countries that spoke talked about the death penalty in their recommendations in those precious 55 seconds that they had to do their review. And then the Biden administration responded to all of those recommendations on March 4th of this year. Um, and it was really disappointing in a lot of ways because the we thought, well, the federal government, uh, President Biden had talked in the campaign that he opposes the death penalty. And we thought that at least with respect to the re recommendations to uh, you know impose a moratorium on executions at the federal level to um, you know commute death sentences at the federal level to take take measures that that the Biden administration could do we thought that they would do more that they would accept more recommendations but instead what the official position was in this March 4th um, uh, memo was that President Biden supports legislatively ending the death penalty at the federal level and incentivizing states to follow the federal government's example. So they kind of uh, took this sort of middle ground, like we, we want to do it, but the federal, the executive isn't going to do it on its own. It's going to wait for Congress to take action. Um, and so it, it was it was really disappointing to see that given what the campaign rhetoric had been on the death penalty. However, we have a couple of victories that we can point to as a direct result of our lobbying. Uh, one country we met with and lobbied was Malta. Malta, for some reason, has taken a newfound interest in human rights issues, including on the death penalty. And Malta is issued its recommendation was, and you have to listen carefully because the United States rejected the first part and accepted the second part. So this is Malta's recommendation. Establish a moratorium on the death penalty at the federal level with a view to complete abolition and take measures to avoid racial bias in capital punishment. So that last part, take measures to avoid racial bias in capital punishment, the Biden administration accepted that. So that's a promise the Biden administration made going forward. So there'll be five years for the federal authorities to show that they have indeed taken measures to avoid racial bias and capital punishment. So we think that's a really good victory to get that promise, to get that commitment out of our federal government. And it gives, it sort of opens the door to say, okay, this promise was made in front of the world community. Now, what are we going to do? So you can keep your promise. What is it that you, what concrete steps are you going to take to ensure that racial bias is avoided in capital punishment? The second uh, recommendation that we can tried to take credit for was Belgium. We had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, the Belgian diplomat and we had a really good conversation about things. And one of the things we talked about was this World Day topic about access to counsel. And the Belgian delegate was really receptive to that. And this is actually the only recommendation on the death penalty that the Biden administration accepted in full. And this is what Belgium recommended. And it also relates very well to Just Mercy. Belgium recommended that we that the United States improve access to legal assistance for individuals who may face a death sentence. So the Biden administration accepted that, meaning they promised that that way they will improve access to legal assistance for people who may may be subject to the death penalty. And I think that's a great way to sort of move forward to say, okay, Biden administration, what are you going to do to improve that legal assistance? It's all also a way to really dramatically reduce the number of people sentenced to death. Because as you see in Just Mercy, inadequate legal representation is a really big reason why people are sentenced to death in the first place. Um, it's not only that their lawyers are not skilled, but it's also what we call in the human rights world equity in arms. When the prosecutors are seeking the death penalty, they have all the resources of the state in their hands. And a public defender, for example, they may be well qualified, but they may not have the resources to do a full investigation, to present the case for why a person, even if they're convicted, shouldn't be sentenced to death, to do all of that groundwork. And oftentimes that's what results in these injustices in capital cases is that the legal representation is not adequate. So we were really, really happy with Belgium's recommendation, but even more excited that the Biden administration accepted that recommendation um, and, and give, it gives us a chance to 
do more advocacy going forward to make sure that that promise is kept. So um, another thing I want to mention with, with respect to the federal death penalty, and then I'll wrap up, is that is Puerto Rico. Um, so Puerto Rico is an interesting uh, situation. There, the last execution in Puerto Rico was in the 1920s. And in 1952, when Puerto Rico adopted its current constitution, that constitution said that the death penalty shall not exist. So the people of Puerto Rico have definitively rejected the death penalty. And yet federal prosecutors continue to seek the death penalty in federal cases in Puerto Rico, even though the people of Puerto Rico have rejected the death penalty. And there's a new case happening in Puerto Rico that uh, where federal prosecutors, it looks like, are going to seek the death penalty. Um, this is a boxer who has been accused of killing a pregnant woman, and they've said that it is a, a death eligible offense. It's happening in federal court. And it's really, a, and a lot of times, another issue is the victim's families. And in this case, the family member of the victim says that they don't want the death penalty. And yet, federal authorities are going forward and pushing for the death penalty. And this is something President Biden could just do with, 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 uh, you know, it, just by communicating to the Department of Justice, we're no longer going to seek the death penalty. That's something easy that the president could do, and he's not doing it. And he could do that, and that would mean that, like for this case in Puerto Rico, the death penalty would be off the table. So there really are opportunities for the executive at the federal level to take action um, where they're not, and pressure from people who care about the death penalty could really make a difference. So I, I want to close wrap up there. Um, but I, I'm happy to talk about how you can get involved if people want to learn more about things, things that you can do. Um, but happy to answer questions as well. I don't want to talk, talk too much more. So, so I'll wrap up with that and um, hand it back to Katya and to Stephen, I guess. Thank you so much, Amy. That's wonderful. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions um, soon. Stephen, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Katya. And thank you, Amy. Uh, it is reassuring to know that uh, every day you wake up to work on uh, human rights in general and on the death penalty in particular. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here today. I, uh, I'm humbled uh, to come visually or online into uh, a state that has abolished the death penalty uh, because I am coming to you from uh, the largest death row in California uh, with close to 750 uh, souls on California's death row. Uh, it's an abomination and uh, it is something uh, that uh, scores of people here are, are working strenuously um, to uh, abolish the death penalty in California and by extension across the country. I'm particularly impressed that you framed this program uh, around the movie and the, the movie uh, Just Mercy and the work of Brian Stevenson. Uh, I hope uh, virtually all of those attending uh, today's program have seen uh, the movie uh, Just Mercy. If you haven't, uh, please be sure to see it as a consequence of this uh, discussion. Uh, it's an extraordinary movie because it's about an extraordinary man. And I have the privilege of knowing Brian Stevenson, of having uh, worked with him, uh, of having been inspired by him. Uh, he is a national treasure. Uh, if I could go publicly on record, uh, President Biden's first Supreme Court uh, justice nominee should be Brian Stevenson. Uh, Brian has uh, worked uh, tirelessly for uh, justice uh, in the criminal injustice system, and in particular in the area of the death penalty. Just Mercy is important because it was a very popular motion picture. Uh, I'm convinced that the arts, uh, movies, television, books, fine art, music, uh, have a powerful impact on society. Uh, it's now many years ago that the motion picture Dead Man Walking, uh, telling the story of Sister Helen Prejean, uh, who had the, uh, the overwhelming duty to walk 
uh, men in Louisiana to their death. Uh, she wrote a compassionate book, Dead Man Walking. That has become a movie, an opera, a play, um, and it has had a significant impact in humanizing the men and women uh, who are sent to death row. So in a, a death penalty movie series, I hope uh, many of you will track down a dead man walking. I'm also grateful that uh, today's program is sponsored uh, by uh, Citizens for Global Solutions, the solution uh, to one of the world's greatest cruelties is to abolish the death penalty. Uh, and in my remarks in a moment, I will come uh, to how much uh, the United States is an outlier uh, when it comes to civilized countries uh, around the world. Uh, unfortunately, it was in the waning days of the uh, Trump administration uh, when Donald Trump and William Barr at the um, Department of So-Called Justice uh, convened um, 13 men and women being executed in a bloodbath of executions in the waning days of the uh, Trump administration. That killing spree ended a 17-year bipartisan federal uh, moratorium, uh, which had existed, uh, betraying the racist nature of the death penalty. Six of the executed men were Black. One was a Native American. Uh, Dustin John Higgs, a Black man, uh, was executed on the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, how cruel can a system be uh, to add cruelty to cruelty in doing that? Uh, 90 minutes before that execution, the six member conservative majority of the US Supreme Court rejected uh, all of Higgs's appeals. Even without holding a hearing to listen to the claims uh, that were being made by his uh, lawyers. In her vehement dissent, uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor uh, put the deadly series of executions in a historical context. Quote, the federal government will have executed more than three times as many people in the last six months than it had in the previous six decades. She noted the unprecedented rush of federal executions which had left numerous legal disputes undecided. Uh, in one case, the government scheduled executions at such a quick pace uh, that those facing execution had to fast track their challenges to their sentences, while in other cases, the court did not have a chance to even determine if the executions were legal. She concluded that rather than permit an orderly resolution of these suits, the government consistently refused to postpone executions and sought emergency relief to proceed before courts had meaningful opportunities to determine if the executions were even legal. This is not justice, Justice Sotomayor said and she was right. Uh, tragically, uh, the United States, as we have heard um, uh, from Amy, uh, is an outlier uh, in this uh, form of barbaric punishment. Uh, well over 108 countries across the world have abolished capital punishment either in law uh, or in practice and another seven have limited it to war crimes. Uh, the US remains part of a gruesome uh, international league of state killing countries uh, led by China, as Amy said, uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Egypt. 
Uh, the United States remains a deadly outlier uh, in the world, despite the fact that public support for the death penalty has steadily declined in recent years, as Amy also pointed out. In fact, support for the death penalty in the US is at an all time low, uh, at 55% down from 60% just in 2016 and 68% in 2001. Uh, since 2009, uh, six states, uh, New Mexico, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, New Hampshire, and Colorado have abolished the death penalty. And the courts in Washington and Delaware have declared it uh, unconstitutional. And there's every reason why uh, these states, uh, either the legislatures, the voters, or the courts uh, are abolishing uh, the death penalty because it is riddled with overwhelming flaws, including racial and economic uh, disparities, mistakes and misconduct by police, prosecutors, jurors, and judges, ineffective assistance of counsel, junk science, false confessions, mistaken eyewitness identifications, and if this matters to some people, the exorbitant cost of uh, implementing the death penalty. These flaws exist throughout the American legal system. We know that, but when it comes to the death penalty, the mistakes cannot be corrected once a defendant has been executed. Early in my work on the death penalty, uh, I told an audience that the death penalty is the perfect punishment in an all too imperfect system. The perfect punishment because it eliminates the individual entirely forever for closing his or her legal challenges, let alone their uh, rehabilitation as a human being. Uh, sure enough, these flaws have led uh, to the worst results of all, the execution and sentencing of innocent people. Uh, since 1973, according to the Death Penalty Information Center, 173 former death row prisoners have been exonerated uh, of all charges relating to the wrongful convictions, which sent them to death row. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences reports that at least 4.1% of defendants sentenced to death in the United States were actually innocent. That means that with approximately 2,500 inmates facing execution today, uh, at least 105 are innocent. Uh, that's an appalling error rate. We wouldn't accept that uh, in any other field of activity or, or life. Uh, yet the states that continue the death penalty persist uh, at exposing innocent people to the death penalty. Uh, death Penalty Information Center has concluded that since 1989, at least 18 innocent men have been wrongfully executed in the United States. And DPIC, and you can go to their website for all of this information, the Death Penalty Information Center documents the cases we believe uh, innocent people have been executed. According to DPEC, studies have consistently found racial disparities at nearly every stage of capital punishment, from policing and charging practices to jury selection, jury verdicts, uh, to which cases result in execution. I'm thrilled today to learn uh, that the Biden administration has uh, agreed to avoid racial bias, and I hope they do something about it. The best way to avoid racial bias and all of the other flaws in the death penalty would be for uh, Joe Biden and his attorney general to issue a moratorium on the death penalty and a 
commutation of those on the federal death row. Because uh, at a minimum, these racial disparities uh, are a legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and segregation and discrimination. Half of the 34 defendants sentenced to death uh, in 2019 were people of color, 35% African-Americans and 15% uh, Latinx. Uh, there are a few examples that are really egregious. Out here in California, Riverside County, um, which has sentenced more people to die than any other county in the United States since 2013, 92%, uh, uh, 23 out of 25 of those uh, who have been sentenced to death were Black or Latino. In Los Angeles, my home county, uh, the last 22 people sentenced to death have been people of color. In Harris County, Texas, home to Houston, Texas, 18 of the last 20 condemned defendants have been Black or Latino. And the 19th was uh, of uh, Middle Eastern uh, descent. Uh, in 1980, by comparison, the majority of death row prisoners were white, 54%, uh, although that leaves a huge percentage of non-white. By July 2019, 57.8% were people of color. And the most dramatic increase has been among Latinx uh, population whose proportion of death row more than doubled uh, between 1980 and 2000 uh, and has increased another 4.4% uh, in this century. Uh, this is an abominable uh, situation. It is unacceptable by any measure of constitutional standards, any measure of international standards. It is a blemish uh, on the United States of America. And since we uh, put out the president who conducted uh, the bloodbath at the end of his term, we have installed a president uh, who is avowedly against the death penalty. And um, we can only hope uh, that he will, if he says in response to Amy's report that he is looking to legislation, then I'm telling this audience uh, that in Congress and in the Senate, uh, bills have been introduced to abolish the federal death penalty. If there is any action item uh, for uh, this session or the uh, citizens for Global Solutions, it is to immediately encourage your congresspersons and senators to support the federal legislation to abolish uh, the death penalty. And in the interim, we should not give up on Joe Biden issuing a moratorium on all federal executions and a commutation of those sentences. As I uh, conclude and look forward to questions uh, I want to mention the eloquent dissent uh, in a death penalty case issued in uh, 1994 uh, by Justice Harry Blackman. Uh, he came to the final conclusion after years of grappling with death penalty cases that he had had enough. He noted that despite the effort of states and courts, quote, to devise legal formulas and procedural rules to meet this daunting challenge, the death penalty remains fraught with arbitrariness, discrimination, caprice, and mistake, unquote. And in a momentous statement of personal integrity and moral clarity, he declared, quote, from this day forward, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. Describing his 20 year struggle with the death penalty, he announced, quote, rather than continue to coddle the court's delusion that the desired level of fairness has been achieved and the need 
for regulation eviscerated. I feel morally and intellectually ob obligated simply to concede that the death penalty experiment has failed. It is virtually self-evident to me now that no combination of procedural rules or substantive regulations ever can save the death penalty from its inherent constitutional deficiencies. The problem is that the inevitability of factual, legal, and moral error gives us a system that we know must wrongly kill some defendants, a system that fails to deliver the fair, consistent, and reliable sentences of death required by the Constitution. It has been decades since Justice Blackmun spoke those words. Uh, I am so proud to know and meet Amy because of her personal direct work with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one of my uh, heroes and heroines. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg saw this issue very clearly. I think we've got to hold Joe Biden responsible. We've got to hold his Justice Department responsible. In my introduction, you heard that I'm with a group called Bend the Ark, a Jewish partnership for justice. We take our name from a phrase that Martin Luther King popularized, although it also was originally used by a Unitarian minister. But the arc of history only bends toward justice if we have benders, if we put our shoulder to the wheel, if we organize each day for at least some human rights issue, and for today's purposes, it is the death penalty. I have asked audiences like this to take the $1 one hour pledge. Every day, see to it that you spend an hour uh, organizing, uh, writing letters to the editor, lobbying your legislators, talking to friends and family over the dinner table, and in today's case, all of it for the sake of ending the death penalty. And think of uh, spending a dollar a day, uh, multiply that by the people we see on these screens at $365 a day, support organizations that uh, for today's purposes are dedicated to ending the death penalty. We have this within our grasp. I do believe that it is this generation uh, and it is our political system and the opportunity we have today, the tipping point that is often referred to uh, as a way of ensuring uh, that in this generation, we eliminate this barbaric form of punishment uh, as a solution to the issues of public safety. Uh, I'm committed to that. I'm thrilled to uh, be sharing this time with each of you. Uh, and I promise to stand with you in this struggle. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, thank you again, Amy. Uh, I, I think you used a, a, a better expression that I actually use all the time because I always thought that uh, it's nothing short than medieval, the, this process of killing. I, it's just a legalized killing of somebody. It's nothing different from a criminal killing. Uh, and um, I, I agree with you, uh, Stephen, that's barbaric. And I don't see a reason why a government think that's okay to kill somebody as a punishment to something that a person, you know, to a crime that somebody committed. And it's more horrific to think that 4% of the sentence to death were innocent. 
this number is even bigger, this number that you're giving now. For those who watched um, True Justice, that was uh, um, the documentary uh, um, that uh, with um, Brian Stevenson, he mentioned that in more than 1,500 people that were sentenced to death, 158 were um, exonerated. So that makes uh, an, a, a number that's like unacceptable. Every time that you actually think that uh, this amount of people were sentenced to death and they were innocent, one person for me is, is unacceptable, but this number proves that there are a lot of problem in the, 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 the system. Uh, so you can't afford to just keep sentencing people, um, not only because it's barbarian, but clearly the justice system is unfair, is unjust, is, and it has problems. You can't take this chance, not to mention everything else. Uh, I would love to ask uh, the attendants to ask questions if they have. And actually, Abshak has a question. I don't know, Abshak, do you want me to ask your question or do you want to ask yourself? You can go ahead, like you can ask the question. Okay. So he asks, we see there is a cluster of states down south in the United States that still have death penalty punishment. Does it have anything to do with the crime and poverty rates? Do you want to direct that to one of us or either of us? Either. Amy, you want to take the first shot? Take a first shot. And um, what it has to do with is politics, largely. It, and it's not just individual states, but you can break it down into individual counties that are primarily responsible for people being sent off. And district attorneys are elected and a lot of you know, district attorneys will run on a tough on crime platform. And so they do it for political reasons. That's why they seek the death penalty when the death penalty is available. Um, in terms of why states allow the death penalty, that's also in large part, you know, California is maybe the exception here and there are a few other exceptions, but it's a vestige of slavery. It's a vestige of our country's history with lynchings and the efforts to control and dominate black bodies. Um, there, there's a long history there. Um, but in terms of the actual practice of seeking the death penalty and executing people, uh, it, it's highly influenced by politics. And um, it's not, a, there's, there's not a relationship between crime and the death penalty. I can post a link to a report we submitted to the United Nations recently about the myth that there is a deterrent effect um, by having the death penalty. Um, so I, I think it's, um, it's, there, there's not really a correlation between crime or poverty rates and the death penalty. The death penalty is often seen as a political simplistic solution when crime issues are far more complex. If, 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 a, if a politician really wants to address crime, what they need to do is ensure that people are apprehended promptly. And the severity of the punishment actually has little to do with uh, deterring crime. What, what they need to do is invest the resources in doing thorough, accurate, prompt investigations. Um, a lot of times what you see is there's a lot of pressure to get a conviction and they don't necessarily care that they're convicting the right person. They care that they're convicting someone because that will help um, alleviate public concerns about crime issues. But when the prosecutors and police latch on to one person as a suspect, they tend to get tunnel vision and they don't look at the other possible suspects. They don't look at the flaws in the evidence. They may fabricate evidence Evidence, they made hide evidence, all with the goal of getting a conviction without regard for the fact that that conviction might be for the wrong person and without regard for the fair trial rights of the person who is um, being prosecuted. Uh, Stephen, I'll let you, you yes. pitch, pitch or hit, hit 
um, clean up for me. How's that? You you nailed that. Uh, uh, question and answer. Uh, that linkage, you can map uh, uh, executions and slavery, and it is a legacy of that racist past. I do want to say there are uh, is a movement across the country of progressive district attorneys who are looking at the science of public safety. Uh, there is a district attorney in Philadelphia uh, Larry Krasner, who's uh, opposed to the death penalty. We're very pleased here in Los Angeles County. Uh, Los Angeles District Attorney George Gascon uh, has uh, pledged to not seek the death penalty. So there is a movement of progressive DAs around the country. I want to use this moment to get across a point that sometimes is misunderstood because I uh, emphasized uh, the risk of executing innocent people. I am against the death penalty for any person. I do not uh, make distinctions and you could deliver me a guilty person uh, on a silver platter and I would not want them executed. We have a systemic system and therefore it has to be systemically opposed so that it is a universal doctrine to not use the death penalty. Uh, remarkably, at the International Criminal Court, uh, which I'm sure uh, Amy is familiar with, the charter, the Rome Charter of the International Criminal Court bans the use of the death penalty, even for crimes against humanity uh, and other um, horrendous crimes. So it is a matter of uh, universal import uh, and, uh, and that's what we stand for. Yeah, and I'll add, Brian Stevenson has a really famous quote and I'll, I'll, I'm not gonna get it exactly right, but he says, we're all more than the worst thing that we've ever done. So even if you think about the worst possible, most heinous crime imaginable, that person is still a human being, somebody worthy of dignity and um, you know, when Stephen was talking about it being the perfect punishment, um, one of the things people don't necessarily think about is who actually gets punished through capital punishment. You think it's just the, the person who did the crime, assuming that it's not a wrongful conviction, but it actually punishes far more. It punishes that person's family members, the people that, who love that person, the people who care about that person, and those people People haven't done anything wrong. Uh, one of our World Day Against the Death Penalty themes a couple of years ago has to do with the family members of people sentenced to death or executed and the human rights violations they face uh, because they have a family member who has been sentenced to death. So that's another thing to think about when you think about is, is this really an appropriate crime, even if you're 100% certain that the person committed the crime, and even if that that person that that crime was heinous um it's still it's a simplistic solution and, and there i'm not saying and i don't think anyone who's opposed to the death penalty, death penalty thinks that people shouldn't be punished for crimes of course if you committed a crime you should face punishment but the death penalty is not um not necessary and um is a violation of human rights regardless of the other circumstances yes excellent thank you uh, Vini has a question. Vini, please. I'd address this to both Stephen and Amy. And first and foremost, thank you both for excellent presentations. I uh, walked in the house tonight to set up this uh, um, uh, my webinar here. I picked up the local paper, and it showed that George Gascon has been um, called out unanimously by several cities in Southern California as an unfit DA because of the very things that he stands for. So my question is this, I believe there's two obstacles to eradicating the death penalty. The first is very simple. There's a core of unthinking revenge that runs through the public. It might have a basis in religion or whatnot, but the idea that somebody must pay, and as Amy said, simple solutions for incredibly complex problems. The death penalty is something that can, someone can wrap their head around. And there is a strong strain of revenge that runs through people's souls, whether they admit it or not. But the second obstacle I see is much more insidious, and that is cowardice. I'll use it as an example of the Vietnam War. It was prosecuted for two decades, and it was under both 
Democratic and Republican administrations. And what the Pentagon Papers showed very clearly was that the only reason that the war continued was that politicians were fearful of the blowback from losing Vietnam. In this case, it is the cowardice of our politicians who were afraid of raising the ire of those revengeful people. And so they will not take the steps. I would use Bill Clinton as an excellent example of this with his omnibus crime bill in 1994 that criminalized being black, that created the concept of the super predator. And that the idea that that string of revenge and the cowardice by our politicians to stand up and speak truth to that power, I think stymies us. How do we address those two obstacles? Uh, let me take a, a crack at that initially and thank you, Vinny. Uh, it, is, it is more and more clear that as public opinion moves in the direction of abolition, as I indicated and as Amy mentioned, uh, politicians are beginning to get past the myopia of law and order. Uh, so California elects a governor uh, who immediately, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, institutes a moratorium on executions. Now there is a, a Republican uh, move to recall him, uh, but so far polls are showing that he is going to survive that. Uh, George Gascon, as you said, here in LA, um, uh, was elected on a platform of opposing the death penalty. Uh, Los Angeles County, uh, in both of the initiatives that have sought to eliminate uh, the death penalty, has uh, voted in favor of abolition. Uh, Larry Krasner has um, uh, also won uh, re-election by winning the Democratic primary a few days ago uh, with over 60% of the vote. My point is this, uh, in politics, uh, there is a long lag for public opinion, for science, for facts, for solutions other than the most uh, brutal types of solutions uh, to catch up. But I think that elected officials who are truthful, who are honest, uh, Joe Biden was elected, uh, even though he was avowedly against the death penalty. People will begin to see that other countries and states have created systems of public safety without a death penalty. Uh, and consequently, I think we are moving through a period uh, in which it will no longer be a third rail for a politician to be against the death penalty. Uh, and I believe our job is to create that kind of atmosphere, uh, to write letters to uh, the uh, newspapers when the issue hits the headlines, uh, to thank elected officials when they do the right thing, uh, as well as complaining if they do the wrong thing. Well, those are my thoughts on that. I'm eager to hear what Amy has to say. Thanks. Just a few things to add. I think we can look to other countries that have taken the step to abolish the death penalty and see what lessons there are to be learned there. In both the United Kingdom and France, when the death penalty was abolished in those countries, the public supported the death penalty. But the politicians took the lead. They, they led their country toward abolition and the public went along with it. Their career, the politicians' careers weren't destroyed. The public accepted the move. And now, if you look at the public opinion in those countries, they're, they're hugely against the death penalty. But it took leadership on the part of politicians to make that happen. And that's really what we need to see from, from our politicians. Another thing, and I think Stephen alluded to this, is that there are arguments coming from different parts of the political spectrum that favor abolition of the death penalty. There's an organization called Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty that mobilizes conservatives who are opposed to the death penalty. Like most notably Grover Norquist is opposed to the death penalty. And he's one of the spokespeople for this group. There are conservative arguments for abolishing the death penalty. And so Republicans, other conservatives can be mobilized to work in, in uh, work across the aisle toward abolition. We just need to muster the 
arguments that will resonate with those people, like the cost argument and about like concern about government overreach. Like if you don't trust the government to deliver your mail, do you really trust the government to get a correct conviction and to not botch the execution? So, so tapping into these other arguments that we wouldn't normally make from a human rights perspective, that's another way to get people on board to take that courageous step toward abolition. Another thing I want to address is you hear this very frequently. You heard it when uh, Attorney General Barr announced that they were going to resume federal executions. You heard it in South Carolina with the reintroduction of the electric chair that we just heard about in the news this week. Um, is the victims and their family members, that we owe it to the victims to do this. And this is another misconception. Now, there are certainly some victims, family members of victims who support the death penalty. But actually, if you look at the research, it's a lot more nuanced. And I'll post another link in the chat to a blog post that I did about this when, when Attorney General Barr announced the resumption of execution, sort of calling his bluff on this, we owe it to the victims to do this. It's actually quite damaging for victims, uh, fam family members to go through the process of uh, capital cases. Um, there's an interesting study that compared outcomes in Minnesota and Texas, and the family members of you know, brutal murder victims actually had much better sense of um, resolution and peace and, and all of that in Minnesota, where there was no possibility of the death penalty compared with Texas. So there, there's some interesting research there that I think also helps debunk some of the attitudes that people have about the death penalty and can help sort of build the courage in the political class to take the next step. Thank you so much. Uh, Jack has a question. Jack, please. Yeah, hi. Um, so Amy was talking about uh, the gigantic task of, of tackling too much in one clean sweep uh, as it pertains to uh, abolishing the death penalty in the entire country and instead taking baby steps. And I want to refer to the movie to ask you a question, to ask uh, if anybody cares to comment, um, a question regarding the movie. So in the movie, um, uh, there is, um, this highly shocking thing where a witness, false witness has been manufactured and uh, that leads to the uh, main character being sentenced to death. Uh, would it, a big, good baby step might be to have a higher level of scrutiny and punishment for acts like that. Uh, I'm shocked that uh, there was nothing that was said at the end of the movie about, and I didn't get a chance to Google uh, things. So I don't know what happened to the guy who reversed his uh, accusation. So that's my question. He spent 30 years in jail. Oh. There, there are laws against perjury. They should be fully implemented, uh, as you're indicating, Jack, when the consequences of your perjury is to lead to someone's uh, execution. Uh, those laws are rarely used in criminal or civil cases. Unfortunately, you'd be, or maybe you wouldn't be, but some people are surprised at how much uh, perjury there is uh, in trials. Unfortunately, there is perjury by police officers uh, in many criminal cases. And that's part of junk science that I alluded to and Amy mentioned. Um, we simply have to call it out. The fact that you're, you saw it, that people seeing the movie understand of the risks of relying on jailhouse snitches uh, and false eyewitness accounts and false testimony. But this is part of why we have such a flawed system uh, that uh, uh, it comes to the death penalty being uh, so intolerable because that all of those flaws, I dare say, uh, exist across the criminal system. 
And I'll add that um, it's not only jailhouse snitches and people providing false evidence, but you have police tactics, investigator tactics that lead us, that lead the investigation not toward the truth, but toward getting a convic con conviction. There's a Minnesota-based example, the Minnesota firm Fredrickson and Byron represented in um, post-conviction relief, a man named Damon Thibodeau, and he was convicted and sentenced to death. He confessed to a crime he did not commit, and he was, based on that confession, sentenced to death. So it's not just other people providing that evidence, it's the police using coercive tactics, exploiting the vulnerabilities of people they, su they suspect have committed a crime. And that is another flaw in the system where, yeah, you can, you can go after jailhouse snitches, but it, it's almost like there's so many flaws and so many different flaws come up in different proceedings. It's like playing whack-a-mole. And the better solution for the death penalty is just to take away that game of whack-a-mole because there's always going to be procedural flaws, flaws that, that lead to unfair fair trials, wrongful convictions, and the better solution is to take these high stakes off the table so that the death penalty is an issue. Another issue related to that with the people who are wrongfully convicted, the people who are exonerated also face a lot of issues in terms of reintegration and getting support once they're released. Um, one thing people might not realize, if, if you're convicted of a crime and then ultimately released because you've served your sentence, you get a lot of support services. You get a probation officer, you get a lot of support in terms of housing and all of that. If you're exonerated, they just send you on your way. And you could have been in prison for 20 years, not know what a mobile phone is or how to use it, have no job skills, have deteriorating health because the healthcare in, in the prison population is horrible. And you're just left to flounder on your own, oftentimes with no compensation from the state. So a person like Damon Thibodeau, who confessed to his own crime, in a lot of states, he wouldn't be eligible for any compensation because he contributed to his conviction because he admitted to the crime that he didn't commit. So states would say, well, you're not, you don't have clean hands. You contributed to your conviction. You don't get any compensation. So that's another issue to think about as well when we talk about wrongful convictions. And if I could quickly add, we need a much stronger, robust system of compensation for wrongfully convicted uh, exonerees. We have to make it hurt for counties to fail to train police officers, prosecutors. Uh, it, we need to, that's where we need a deterrent. We need a deterrent uh, against the use of prosecutors uh, knowingly introducing false evidence uh, and the other kind of coercive um, uh, methods that uh, Amy mentioned. If, if it hurt financially in these counties, uh, to engage in wrongful convictions, uh, that would uh, have a positive impact. Right. And um, I just wanted to add, uh, for those of you who didn't watch, uh, there is a documentary, True Justice, that talks about uh, Walter, the, the main character of this uh, Just Mercy, and, and others who even didn't have the same luck that he that had. Uh, and, um, and you're going to see the guy who lied and he gives an inter interview and says, well, I said, well, later I said the truth because we have to say. So he was regretful, I hope, of his lying. Um, but at the same time, um, you are going to see Brian mentioning that uh, the police extracted the confession uh, and they were recording their own methods of pressuring and making somebody to confess what they what you know, a lie. And so they had all in recording. So uh, Walter should never have been uh, convicted, first of all, because everything was a, a big circus and a, a big lie. So for those who didn't watch, um, it's worth a, a true justice documentary. I wanted to, to share a, a quickly a, a short story. Uh, most of you uh, know me well here. And um, I was a, a criminal defense attorney uh, back in Brazil. 
And so I worked in a maximum security prison and we had literally thousands of uh, inmates and uh, all of them uh, didn't have, well, you know, less than 1% per would have uh, private lawyers. So everybody else would count on us. And it was just two of us, two uh, female lawyers in this uh, ma maximum security prison. And um, so I was uh, by myself reading one of the cases and I said, this, this can't be right. So I, I took home and it was like a, a big file. It takes a, a dedication for you to do. So um, I found out some gaps and it, it was not possible. And I, I have my other friends, uh, uh, defense attorneys in other uh, um, uh, prisons and I, I communicated with another one, I found out that my client had the same name of another person who actually was in prison. And I found where he was and because I was able to communicate with my colleague. So I call my client and I talked to him and I said, were you there? Because he had many crimes. He was not the only one. So this was one. And I asked him this when he comes, were you there in this? And, and he started getting all nervous and he said, I wasn't. And I said, why didn't you tell me? I can help you. He had a crisis of cry. He says, how did you know? He asked me and I said, I read your file. The guy cried, which is, you know, I think all for all the lawyers, criminal lawyers, I think is one of the worst things, but I think he was crying of happiness because I, he said, I didn't think you would believe me. And so I, I filed a, um, what we call in, in the Brazilian law, in the civil law, a revision of his case because he was in that case he had many crimes so he was there for multiple crimes but that one it was not his and it was like six it was a robbery with gunpoint in another city and that one was not his so you see uh you you are going to see failure all over and I, I want to believe that he said to his former attorney that he was not the person. He was not heard. And th then there were so many you know, gaps. How come nobody saw that before? And we just see that in the enforcement of sentence. So we needed to be mindful that the justice you know, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, investigators, everybody is human and they make mistakes. But while a person is still alive, you can try to make up, you know, and to fix it. After you put somebody to die, there is no coming back. And I'm gonna tell you, if somebody kills anybody in my family, there is no money that is going to pay back that life that was taken. Um, uh, Vini, you have a question. Uh, actually, it's a comment and it relates to what Jack was asking about, about the character of Ralph Myers. Uh, one thing that they did in the movie, and it's a, uh, a warning, this is going to give away some of the end of the movie, is that they did an incredible job of subtlety and nuance as they built this character. When you first see him, he's reprehensible. He's really terrible. But you find out by the end of the movie that he was as much of a victim as what happened as the man who was on death row, as Walter was, because he was coerced in the cruelest possible terms. The true criminals in this movie, the true criminals in this case, were the people who were set to provide justice, the police officers, the district attorneys, and the judges. And I saw that there are many people at first glance, again, at first glance, they're gonna look like criminals. 
And of course, Ralph Myers was a criminal. He served 30 years and he perjured himself in the beginning, but he did so because again, he was a victim himself. Yeah. And, and just uh, I was actually... to reminder everybody to, to remember to remind everybody, you know, um, Walter spent 30 years in prison being uh, innocent. And then he went back uh, to freedom. He spent some time living with Brian in Brian's house. He, le he lived with a few other people and he never had the chance to fully uh, be able to readjust because it was so much time and, um, and he developed a dementia, unfortunately, that um, the medicine, the, the doctors said it's a type of dementia that you develop when you have a heavy uh, trauma and he died without ever, you know, fully re recovering from what happened. So we are responsible for that too. Katya, as, as we've, as we close up, as my concluding remarks, if you got something out of the movie, Just Mercy, please get the book. The audio book is read by Brian Stevenson. You hear his voice and his compassion. Uh, it's an extraordinary book, whether you listen to it or read it. It has far more details about other cases uh, that Brian has handled and the details of Walter's case as we've discussed today. It's an extraordinary, uh, it's been assigned in schools and elsewhere. Uh, and I could not recommend more as a follow-up to this uh, terrific session uh, that you read, Just Mercy. Right, thank you for that. And as we, oh, Kathleen, you were muted. Um, the um, group has talked about the effect on uh, people who are unjustly convicted. It's talked about their families. And what is the effect on the um, correctional officers who have to carry out the execution? Can I just add to our movie list, a movie called Clemency. Clemency came out last year with Alfre Woodard as a warden. If you wanna see the dramatization of the toll this abominable form of punishment takes on wardens, on guards, on chaplains and others caught up in this system, Clemency starring Alfre Woodard is an extraordinary movie and uh, I recommend it highly. Uh, you are right, and by way of saying that, uh, this system is corrosive, uh, it is debilitating. Uh, we had a former warden in California uh, who uh, left her job and opposed the death penalty. Uh, it takes a toll on every single person in the system, uh, everyone touched by this system, and as well as all the families and the rest of us. Thank you. And we wrap up. Um, would you like, Amy, um, to have final uh, remarks? Amy? I just want to thank everyone for being part of the discussion and for being concerned about the issue. I think it was a really great conversation. And I think you know, as, as Stephen said, the arts film, is, it's a great way to get people used to what can be a really heavy topic that, you know, it, it's important to have these discussions, but it's important to have it sort of on a common ground and individual stories can really help change people's minds. Um, so to the extent that you can educate yourself mm -hmm. and tell stories to other people, give them examples, give them case studies, it can be really moving. One of the most moving case studies I heard was um, at a convening about the death penalty, and it was a mother whose son, he was 18 years old, he had been convicted and sentenced to death. She was really concerned about his welfare. He, he was still in high school, and she wanted him at least to, to finish high school, get his GED. 
they wouldn't allow her to provide her son with educational materials so that he could get his GED because it wasn't consistent with his sentence. In other words, they said he, he, was, he was going to be dying, so why should he be able to finish high school, even if his mother wanted to provide him with all of those resources? So it, it's, it's really astonishing the amount of cruelty that is part of the system here in the United States. It's part of it in, in other countries as well. But to the extent that you want to persuade others, muster those stories, find those stories, educate yourself, and tell those stories to other people, to find out what resonates with them so that they can be mobilized to act as well. So I, I really encourage you to do that. It's, it's the best way, perhaps the only way to motivate people is by telling stories, stories of injustice and giving them reason to act, to change. And I would only add that we have to act on, on those stories and we have to take, I urge you to take the $1, one hour pledge, I urge, citizens for global solutions to make letter writing, petition signing, lobbying of Congress persons and senators and anyone listening from other states uh, to really make a push. We can, uh, to abolish the federal death penalty uh, would be a huge signal to the remaining states around this country. Uh, we can do that, we can organize around that. Uh, I think we can make a difference and I'm so grateful for today's program. Thank you so very much, Stephen, Stephen Rode. Thank you so much, Aim Berquist, for you coming here. Uh, it was a wonderful um, session. We learned so much from you both. And thank you for everybody who attended. This is an ongoing program from Citizens for Global Solutions in Minnesota. You, you can find all the programs that we have in our website, citizensforglobalsolutionsminnesota.org. Please visit our website. We do have a Facebook page, Global Solutions Minnesota. We recently uh, made a Twitter, so we are there as well. Please visit us, follow us for updates. Our um, next movie discussion or documentary discussion is June 17. Please uh, go to our website to learn what is the next title. We also will have um, an event. It's a human rights forum. We will talk about Yemen is facing war and COVID-19 alone. It's going to happen in, Mar in May 26. It's a Wednesday. Uh, 5 to 6 p.m. Central Time. And we also will have a Human Rights Forum on June 3rd, 30, and it's the racism in the U.S. Uh, so it's going to be good. I, I will not reveal the name of our, our speakers yet, but um, we so you soon is gonna you're gonna have a surprise a good surprise i hope to have you guys attending again in our next uh, event if you don't receive um, the invitations from me please write and i will make sure that i do most of you i think do thank you very much for inviting we learned so much from all of you Thank you again, Amy and Stephen, for coming and giving your time to us. We really appreciate you and everything that you have been doing to end the end uh, the death penalty in the United States. Thank you so very much. A big hug for you all. Thanks, Katya and everyone. Have a good night. Bye.